All right, folks, Bryce Holdaway here with Jeremy Shepard and Ben Kingsley for this very special Facebook Live brought to you by both the Property Couch and, of course, Location Score. Hello, gents. Good day, Bryce. How are we? Very good. We're in for a good night. But uh, I guess the context for tonight's chat is very, very simple. We, uh, we ran a series of webinars on hotspots and how to find them. Mm-hmm. And we were inundated, uh, absolutely inundated with questions. And... Um, Let's be honest, men. We're not very big. To- you know, we're not very fast typers. No, we're not. So we figured it would probably be easier to um, to do this Facebook Live rather than uh, answer them individually. So uh, we're Correct. a bit of fun, and, and, um, and it's going to be recorded, which is even better. So it is going to be recorded. So on the website as well. <laughs> as I just double, triple check that we are, we um, are. I can see over here, Bryce. Well, there I we go. go. Look so. at that. Oh, how good's that? You can so see me can, looking down with the you can delay. See yourself. Oh, we've got a couple of little. So I'm just going to sit here and watch the love heart fly past. <laughs> All right, now Ivis doesn't want to be in, so she's making me pass it out. But, Hello, um, Damien. Oh, and just a shout out to my you know, parents in law who I found out when I booked this time slot that they were flying over from Perth and so they've just arrived. Hi, Gordon. Hi, Lorna. <laughs> I'm at work. <laughs> Catch up with you soon. But uh, so I guess the, uh, the, format, the format of tonight is uh, we're going to go through some of those questions and mm. cover those off. Thank you very much. And, um, and then we're going to go to your questions. So we appreciate anyone who's given up the bachelorette. They've oh, given up on? offspring. Sorry, guys. See you later. <laughs> yeah, you're all right. <laughs> uh, come and listen to us, which is uh, terrific. But we, uh, we might uh, kick it off. Uh, Rena, we see you. Thank you. Tristan, hello. Claire, Adam, thanks for joining, guys. Um, so, all right, let's kick it off. So our first question um, is from Louise. Louise. Um, Hey guys, love your work. I'm curious why you look for very low stock on market. Actually, before we go there, guys, we might yeah. actually build some context around these sure. questions because for mm. the past, uh, as I said, for the past sort of 10 days, we've been running some some uh, webinars mm. on uh, what we look for when we're, the research tools that we're looking for when we're trying to find these hotspots. So for those people who watched that a little while ago or maybe someone who might have forgot some of the details, it's probably worth us recapping um, what we covered off. And I guess... The point is there was eight key variables, eight key metrics, wasn't there? Mm, yeah. Can you remember? Yeah, I can. <laughs> this will be a test voice. <laughs> so obviously for me, auction clearance rates. So that's pretty simple in terms of measuring the percentages of properties that are being sold at auction. We've got days on market. So obviously the lower the days on market, you can absolutely see that there's obviously trending. We've got stock on market. So the higher the stock, obviously the more oversupply the marketplace will be. So that's obviously another one. Um, we've got uh, yield. So we're looking at the yield in the marketplace. We've got percentages of owner occupier versus uh, oh, investor. Do you want to do that? You want to do the one that's left? <laughs> what was left? How many did you get through? Did you do online five. search interest? No. So okay, so that's the number of people that are looking for property Correct. versus how many properties are available. Yep. Is that seven? No, that's, that's six. Six. Two, six. Two to go. Vacancy rates? Vacancy rates, I didn't do vacancy rates, that's okay, seven. so the number of properties that are currently vacant out of all the landlord-owned properties. And then number eight. Or the investor owner occupier ratio, did you do that one? Yeah, you got yeah, that. Yeah, got that one. Or oh, discount. 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 So, oh, the discount. percentage difference between original asking price and eventual Oh, and they're up price. on the screen. Yes. So, yeah, we can see them there. <laughs> right. that, was, that was a good effort. We're just professional. We're a professional effort here. So, uh, so that was the context. And the, the webinar was uh, showing you actually how you could do it yourself. Um, but obviously, there was a solution that we provided for that because collating that information is, is quite difficult to mm. do across 15,000 plus suburbs in real time, being able to compare. So that's when we introduced location <laughs> score. Um, so if anyone uh, needs a refresher on that, locationscore.com.au. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately today, we just want to go through all those questions. Let's um, rip it. Yeah. So Let's rip it. What about Louise first? Yes. So, hey guys, love your work. I'm curious why you look for very low stock on market mm-hmm. uh, rather than high stock on market. If you were to go with buying when others are fearful and selling when others are greedy, uh, Warren Buffett strategy, then wouldn't you try to purchase in a buyer's market where stock on market is higher? Or am I interpreting the data wrong? Good question, Louise. Okay, well, I've, I want to take that first bit, that stock on market. Obviously, supply and demand are the um, dictators of price growth in any commodity or service, real estate being no different. So we want markets to invest in that have the lowest possible supply and the highest possible demand. 
So a low stock on market makes sense from that supply and demand, that supply side of the supply and demand question. And uh, with respect to the Buffett strategy or? So, so what it's basically saying is, do you, do you take opportunity when others are fearful? So in other words, if you go into an oversupplied market, would you be able to get a better bargain? But the question there, Louise, is how long can you wait? Mm. I mean, if you're going to wait five years or seven years for that market to actually recover, so you're thinking I'm buying a bargain because the market's oversupplied, there's potentially five, seven years of opportunity cost. So the whole idea of uh, why we sort of developed Location Score was uh, getting that timing better. Okay, it's, we're in, in terms of we're never going to sit here and say it's absolutely perfect and we've created the, you know, the, the, the most amazing tool. It is a fantastic tool. Um, and what it's trying to dictate to us is when that market is either turning or on the rise in terms of how that does. We could stay in a flat period for years, mm. and that's the Warren Buffett theory. So, you know, when everyone else is being greedy, don't get into the market. But a, a, a price cycle will go like this. And so we're trying to get into that price cycle above the bottom. We don't have, the indicator doesn't dictate finding the bottom. Okay, if someone can, you know, develop a research platform that finds the bottom, let us know. Yeah. We'd like to hear from you. Isn't the yeah. message pretty clear to not overcomplicate it? Just take property out and to put oranges, you know, if you're yeah. just throwing oranges at the market and there's there's more oranges yeah. on the market and then hoping that prices will go up, it's it depends how much supply is coming and like you yeah. say, for how long. Whereas if you've got two oranges and there's three people that want it, you know, yeah. that, that's really what you, uh, really you want simple. in terms of a price thing. So um, it's no different with real estate. And I think if we take a bit of that mystery out, I think it kind of makes a bit more sense. Can I just say that there is a significant difference, though, between equities and real estate. Um, mm. You know, you, you need a roof over your head at night. Mm. You don't need a share portfolio. Uh, everyone who owns shares is an investor, but not everyone who owns a property is an investor. And then you've got this massive timing difference. You can you can trade stock in a minute uh, share market, mm. whereas I mean, five weeks, mm. four to six weeks, mm. let's say, for, mm. for real estate, it's literally 50,000 times slower. Mm. Than, than equities and that that makes a significant difference because totally what you're saying about yeah. the timing liquidity is in the share market uh, because the transaction is a push of a button mm. it's not in the property market and that also allows it to not have the shocks that we see in in you know market corrections and so forth mm. so yeah it, that's all good signs great question Louise all right let's go to the next one uh, when listening this is from Paul um, when listening to all the experts, experts, they talk about buying properties under the median price. From memory, location score talks about market price. Well, uh, typical value. Yeah, we call it typical value. It's, yes. it's like the median. It's really just a combination of a number of different data providers' medians. Mm. Um, but yeah, buying under the median price, I guess it protects you from, from purchasing a property that's uh, perhaps overcapitalized. I don't know about it being a really good uh, metric that you could use to, to you know, find necessarily the right properties within a, a suburb or the right suburbs within a city. I think, um, yeah, it's it's independent. The price is independent of supply and demand for that market. Yeah, well, look, we make some comments um, on the podcast about if you want to be a bit safer in a market, and let's say the median's holding at say seven hundred and fifty thousand. It's okay to be buying in that 650 to 750 range. Mm, yeah. So, um, what we don't sort of subscribe to is this whole idea of buying under market value. Um, they're, they're, you know, the market sets the price. So, to say that it's bought under market might be because on a piece of paper from a valuer they value it at a certain price point and you're buying it lower. But if you're the one who's buying it, where are the other buyers around to support that valuation? So, we'd always believe that the market. The price that's being paid in a, in a fair and open market is the true price. I think what we're talking about here, and maybe what Paul's sort of talking about, is this this idea of of fair market price. Well, really, what we're sort of saying is, if it, as an investor, you don't really want to be buying the very very best property in the suburb if there's no support to push that property higher. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that more in what they call established benchmark pricing. So for those of you who just joined us, I know there's uh, quite a few of you coming on to this Facebook Live. I'm here, Bryce Holdaway, with Ben Kingsley. We're the co-hosts of The Property Couch. And of course, we've got Jeremy Shepherd with us who... We're the, the location the, lads. The location school cool ads. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, but uh, Jeremy's uh, turned property investment research into a passion of his. And mm. 
Uh, we bring an enormous amount of experience onto the uh, the couch here to my left, folks. So plenty of uh, plenty of grunt to answer these questions. But uh, thanks for that question, Paul. Uh, Jenny, does the history on location score for the various measures only go back to January 2016? Uh, well, every chart should show three years. Um, we've got data starting from uh, January 2010, but what you see on location score is just the last three years. So that would be August 2014. Yeah. So and that's a rolling change. Mm. Yeah. So obviously, you know, our, our next month's data is about to come out. So that's three years. It's just showing an indication. And, and we've got, we chart that for every one of the eight variables as well, just mm. to help people get a sense of that market. Good question, Jenny. Thank you for that. Um, hey, guys, having a sneaky watch. This is from Steve. During work, shh. <laughs> we won't say Steve's surname. <laughs> um, can you please advise what the statistical reliability index is tracking and how this is determined? Mate, this right. is right up your alley. Yeah. Mm. Hey? <laughs> uh, one of the most complicated things about location score is the calculation of this statistical reliability. So... Obviously, it's no good just having a single figure. You need to know how reliable it is because we have imprecise data in some markets. We'll look at things like uh, volatility. So if, if the median or vacancy rates are jumping up and down from month to month, then on any one particular month, we're less confident than if it's a smooth sort of curve. So one of the things we look at is volatility. Uh, another thing we look at is volume. Uh, if you're trying to create a median from only three transactions, the median's the middle one, it's going to be highly unreliable compared to 30 transactions. So volume is another thing that goes into this calculation of statistical reliability. Uh, we get data from multiple sources and munge it together. If we can only find data from two sources, that's less reliable than if we get it from four sources. And then we've got things like confirming indicators and conflicting indicators. All up, there's about nine different considerations that go into the calculation of the statistical reliability. It's a score out of 100, so the higher the score, the more reliable is the location score. Munge, is that a term or is that something you made up? Uh, that's no, a term. That's, that's, that's a, a data term. term. You'll yeah. get used to that. Okay. I got used to, when I first saw that, I'm like, mm, mm. is that a term? Yeah, that's a term. Sounds a bit slangy, it doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Munge, there you go, folks. You've learned something else here. So, all right, thank you for that, Steve. Uh, get back to work, I probably would say. Yeah. Steve, yeah. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> oh, no, go back to the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, this one's from Ben. Oh, hi, Ben. Are you writing it? Yeah, like, like a name already, like a bloke already. <laughs> <laughs> Some commentators mention a term called established capital benchmark as an indicator of value of a property versus others in a certain area. Whilst this does not appear to be related to supply and demand, it may be of value to investors looking, to, uh, looking at a specific property in a suburb. Is ECB a legitimate indicator when looking at a particular suburb and is there a place for it as a metric for investors? ECB, isn't it the English cricket ball? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, 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 I'll tackle this one. So um, to, just to bring everyone up to speed, what it's basically doing is when you're going into a suburb and you're looking at a particular location and you, you're comparing a price of a property in that area, what some investors have introduced is this established benchmark pricing, which basically means that if I'm going into a suburb and I'm looking at property prices around the $500,000 mark, it would be nice to know that inside that suburb, there are properties worth a million dollars. And that established capital, oh, sorry, established um, capital value, what was it? Established Bench ECB. Sorry, benchmark. Established benchmark. Established capital benchmark is saying, you know, it's like, it's like checking blind spots. It's like if I'm going into a market and I'm buying in that $500,000 range, and there's properties that sell in that suburb for a million dollars, I've got a bit of confidence in the fact that there's a bit more money in that particular area. Mm. And that's how it's sold from certain types of property commentators. They're sort of saying, it gives me a bit of support. And you know, for many, many years in my, in my early days of research, I would always say, okay, I'm going into a marketplace. Do I wanna buy that $1.2 million, the best property mm. in the market? Mm. Not really, mm. because what's gonna support the push of value any higher? So I'd always say, always look for double the, uh, the established benchmark pricing, okay? So the idea is, if I found a series of properties that are worth a million dollars, and I'm hunting for properties in the five to $600,000 mark, I've got a little bit of comfort with the idea that the property's already set these benchmarks, and so that gives me, you know, it's, it's a warm glow. There's no 
theoretical mm. value to it uh, in terms of supply and demand. You just don't want to be a pioneer, do you? No, and you don't mm. want to be, you know, in, in property investment, we really don't want to trade in that top 25% quarter mm. because in certainly in the, in the sort of more established markets and the blue chip country, that top 25 is the most volatile. That's the stuff that bounces around when the executives don't get their bonuses and the share market crashes. So it's really important to understand that. So if you're buying around median or just below median, it's actually a bit of a comfort story for you around the compression risk, which is always what I call the downside risk when you're investing in that market. So there's no science to it. It's just part of that process to say, am I going into a market? Because if you go into a greenfield area, and every one of the properties are four bedroom, two bathroom, selling for 480 off the plan. Where's your established benchmark pricing? Well, they are because it was a paddock a week, a year ago. Correct. And there's no, so, so in reality, there's no one who's proven the market can hold a value of a million dollars mm. or proven that can hold a value of $700,000. Mm. So that's what it refers to. So a lot of commentators who sell um, off the plan, house and land packages, they like that comfort that if they're you know, trying to pitch to sell for four hundred or five hundred thousand, and there's eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar properties in the locality. They, that's how they convince the buyer that it's a good thing. Yeah, nice, very good. Anything to add? Happy with that? Well, I, I'm just thinking that might, might not be the best metric for no. supply and demand, but it's a good safety it's, metric. Yeah, it's like one of those counter variables. for risk. Yeah, yeah, blind spots. And that's a good yeah. point with location scores. It's the starting point, and there's a few other things that you mm. do after, and we'll get to that yeah, in a yeah. couple of the other questions yeah. that come up. But uh, thank you, Ben. Did, ben answered the one from Ben. You sure it wasn't the one that you sent? Yeah, good you on you, Ben. Keep, oh, you more from Ben. ben. Is that another <laughs> one you've written another one in. Gosh. Is there a way to track the location score for a suburb over time? So a report based on date range showing variation in location score over time. That's one for you, mate. You created it. Well, there's the historical chart. You can see the last mm. three years. But I'm guessing Ben wants a measure of change. A lot of people ask about trending, trending location score. You know, is it going up or is it going down? Is that important? And uh, I'm not a huge believer in that, that trend analysis because... I think that what the location score is doing is it's telling you, it's a lead indicator. It's mm, telling you mm, what's going to happen. Yeah. When your skin sweats when you're hot. It gets goosebumps when you're cold. It's called a, we're, we're homeostatic organisms, always trying to maintain balance. And there's this similar tug of war between supply and demand, always trying to maintain balance. The majority of markets are, are in balance, which makes sense. So mm. every time they get out of balance, there's this pressure on them to come back to balance. So the further the trend goes in one of those extreme directions, the more pressure there is that's going to turn around, go the other way. So it, it doesn't really mean anything to me whether you've got a location score of uh, 60 that's been trending up. I would, I would prefer a lo- to invest in a market with a location score of 70 that's that it might be even trending down mm. because it's 70. 70 is better than 60. You don't know if they're going to turn around the next month. So I think yeah. that's what Ben is is looking for there so that he can gauge the trend of lo- of the change in lo- location score over time. It's about building confidence to execute, isn't it? Whereas what you're saying is, don't look at that, just look at the opportunity here. And that is that when it's out of balance, and we're saying that when demand is exceeding supply, that's out of balance. And the consequence of that is usually capital growth. Yeah, capital growth to rebalance it. So, that's right. So the prices go up and that subdues demand. Yes. And you might have some increase in supply with development. Eventually, yeah, it comes back to... And that's why he's the guru, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. That's why he's here. That's why he's teaching you all about this stuff. Yeah, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't like the guru tag. Here's one, here's one from Mandy. I'm keen, uh, I'm keen to buy, but not sure which is the best state to invest in using my self-managed super fund. Irrespective of what entity you're in, um, yeah, you that's, a, go at this that, that's a loaded question, isn't it? So, Mandy, there's 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 a lot more to understand about, um, you know, price point, what you're looking for, is it growth, is it balance, is it yield? So, based on that question, I think we'd have to say that um, we need a bit more detail. Yeah, we would. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, look, price point is a big one, mm. and be governed by where the demand is exceeding supply. It doesn't matter what vehicle you're buying it in. Um, whether it's in your personal name, whether it's in partnership, whether it's in a company or whether it's in a smurf, that's not, that's not relevant. What is relevant is to sort of say, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a budget and in that budget, I'm going to use um, some research to support my justification for spending that money in that particular market. And we're saying the best 
research to look for is the demand and supply in that particular market. And the location score can be a leading indicator for that also, but uh, bear in mind, usually um, self-managed super fund, again, with the generalisation, is a longer play because mm. you're doing it um, for a while. So you want to be thinking about what's, um, you know, a, a lot of clients sort of suggest mm. where should I buy. Well, the big metropolises are a good place to park mm. self-managed super fund assets because you're playing the long game, you can hold them for a long time. But um, I think it, I think we'll just um, yeah, sort of point. tidy that one up to say we need a bit more information. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, where so, the data tells you to go. Thanks, Mandy. Um, what websites am I best to monitor to find major infrastructure projects in construction or proposed? Cheers. And that's from Jacob. Um, infrastructure.gov.au. Go and check that out. So thanks for your question, Jacob. Next one. Uh, do the high location scores, i.e. greater than 80, match your professional opinions on where you would recommend to buy? For example, Risdon Vale looks to be a fringe suburb of Hobart. Gents. Right. Yeah. This is the fun bit. This is probably, you know, we're putting a lot of meat on the bone for this one because this is the, the most common mm. question we get asked about. Yeah, location score is just measuring supply and demand. And when you're at the end of a boom, for example, uh, Sydney, uh, parts of Melbourne now too, obviously people are stretched for uh, affordable locations. All the prices have gone up closer to the city in the highly desirable areas. And that growth sort of spreads out to the fringe areas. Mm. So it, it is expected that fringe areas will have their period of above average growth rate. And then there'll be periods where uh, markets closer to the CBD will have above average growth rates. And it, it's, it's really a case of where we are in the timing of that market's cycle. Mm. And uh, there, there's definitely evidence to support that, that markets closer to CBD long term will have superior capital growth, but for a short period of time, the demand could exceed supply by a greater degree in fringe suburbs. Yeah, I mean, if I can add to that, obviously on the podcast, we're, we're, we're all about educating you on the property couch, and we've always taken a long-term view about that education. What we don't want to do, because property is a high-value transaction, is we don't want to be encouraging you to speculate in property, mm. okay? because. For every area that you get right, you might get five of them wrong, and you only have one or two opportunities at this because of the high value mm. that you're transacting in. So we've always been conservative in regards to delivering that. And so the data also suggests to us that those um, inner city areas over the longer period of time have returned better long-term capital growth. But remember, demand and supply is a leading indicator. So it can be a short-term indicator of what that market is. So if, I, if someone turned around to me and said, well, there's a score above 80 and that particular area might grow in value by 25%, any type of 25% return is a damn good one. So, you know, it, it's, that is leading us into to do more research on that area. Now, if I can also add that with historically low interest rates at the moment, we have seen more affordability come in. So low interest rates means borrowers can borrow more money and that is rising all of the property values at the moment. So we have seen in this particular cycle, middle and outer fringe areas have done exceptionally well, especially in the Sydney market where it's also been underpinned by strong economic growth, good jobs growth, good infrastructure growth, all of those other things that are doing that. So we've got all of this value lifting up and that's exactly what the data was suggesting to Jeremy in 2013, 14, when he was screaming to people get into the Sydney market Whereas we're all looking for the affordability story in other markets, mm. the data was true and it, and it outperformed the marketplace. So it's really important to understand that depending on your price point, depending on your risk profile, um, the data is pretty reliable because obviously we've aggregated it, we've obviously cleansed it, we've put some statistical reliability around it. So from all of those mechanisms, we are getting into a better position to make decisions. So can you make money on the fringes? Yes, you can. Can you make money in long term in, in blue chip? Absolutely, you can. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, these fringe suburbs, um, they may represent a higher risk for oversupply because there could be a lot of vacant mm. land nearby and if developers go crazy, then yeah, it could ruin, ruin your market. So the first thing I check after location score is I go to the council website, I check to see if there are any development applications there and how many are going to spoil that supply side of the yes. equation. Yeah. And you can also check uh, satellite imagery, look for vacant land that could be developed, not parks and, and, yeah. and 
ponds and so on, but actual developable, developable land. And then the final one we also, which we said on the podcast was, sorry, the webinar, was um, the ABS data. Mm. You know, making sure we look at that ABS data for, for planning permits. Mm. And that, that does drill down into, you know, lower local government area locations. So you're getting a sense of that. But the first thing, absolutely, Jim, you look at an area and it's got all of this farmland around it, mm. even if it's showing really strong score at that point, that would be crossed out by us. Okay, so remember, it's, it's, it's leading us in from the top down and it's the first thing we look at. So this is, a, this is a big time saver, but we've still got to do our fundamental research under that when we get to the particular suburb. So there you go, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us. So I've noticed there's uh, quite a few people joining us in the last five to ten minutes. So if you are wondering what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, locationscore.com.au. If you want to check out your suburb, you can go to our homepage, put in your suburb, and we will tell you exactly what your location score is for the suburb that you live in or that you're most interested in as well. And if you're wondering about uh, the metrics that we've been talking about, um, you can go to locationscore.com.au and all the metrics are there with some videos that accompany that. So feel free to check that out after the Facebook Live. But what we're doing here is we're answering questions uh, from the webinars that we held over the last sort of 10 days. And uh, we just didn't have time on the webinar gents to get through. So we're getting through them today. But uh, Nathaniel said, firstly, Many thanks for the data and overview and also the podcast and book. I've consumed all material you guys have produced. I guess the difficult part for me personally is finding a place to start when you're looking at so many suburbs. <laughs> I started my research by listing all suburbs within a 25 kilometer radius of the city I was interested in. Then included if the suburb had a train line from there, I listed the location score of each suburb and the median price of properties to try to narrow my searches to a handful of suburbs. I may be suffering from analysis paralysis and I'm still to close out a purchase. Some feedback on location score I'd love to be able to filter on some of the metrics, i.e. if I want to know what suburbs in Brisbane have the best rental returns only or best supply ratio, etc. I think it will help with filtering or pinpointing suburbs a lot better. P.S. Not a question, just feedback. Keep up the great work. <laughs> so I think that's a, uh, a sum of the parts is... Is I the agree. whole greater than the sum of the parts there? But keep going on that. I mean, you shouldn't say to yourself that I'm only going to limit myself to one or two suburbs in, in, you know, when we're buying for our clients in our own businesses. It's really important to understand that um, we might still have eight to ten suburbs because we're still trying to find that, that bit of gold, that property piece that's gold. Remember owner-occupier appeal, you know, human interest, human behaviour piece attached to that. So from our point of view, we'll always keep our options open until the best opportunity comes up that we can buy in those areas. So if you're trying to get it down to one or two particular suburbs, uh, open your mind up a little bit from that point. Yeah, very good point. I mean, there's, there's an, I guess, an extension of his question here. Um, on vacancy rates, rapid increases in vacancy, particularly units, makes sense from a supply perspective, i.e. new developments. What's the driver for rapid decreases in vacancy rate? Uh, as per the Southback example. On the webinar, yeah. Mm, so, yeah. Um, yep, I'll, I'll have a go. Take that one. Yeah, yeah, so, so it, it's pretty clear that, yes, when you get a new flood of stock coming on the market and that data hits the search engine portals and where we're scraping that data from, it's important to understand that there is, that we're going to see that spike. Now, the other way around is obviously where, you know, what, what's collapsing that. So it could be that some of those properties are being removed from the data capture that we're doing. So we've got to be careful there. But it could also be a story of, which is what's happened in Melbourne of recent times. You know, 12 months ago, the ABS was concerned, mm -hmm. uh, and sorry, RBA was concerned about um, the sort of supply side of apartments in Melbourne. But we've seen record numbers of population growth. Um, we've seen record numbers of students um, studying here in Melbourne, and that has been absorbed. Mm. So they are less worried about the Melbourne market, but still concerned a little bit about the Brisbane market. So it can be a story of uh, economic activity, economic prosperity in those particular areas, more people moving there quickly. And in regional towns and so forth, you know, new mines starting up uh, needs that sort of capital infrastructure built. So there's a rush of arrivals, and so that vacancy rates can collapse really quickly. Yeah, as simple as another. Market. Yeah, another business just moved in, yeah. employed a hundred people all in one hit, and they want to live close. So, and the final one I can think of is is like a, a seasonal market. So, Cairns is a perfect oh, yeah. example of that. So, the wet season, everyone leaves, but then the, you know the better weather comes up in the north, 
and everyone in the you know the Mexicans want to get uh, north of the border because it gets a bit cold down here. So we all rush up there. So they need to employ you know restaurant people, waiters, uh, hotel people, tourism people. So all of a sudden, a new flood of new arrival of workers come into that area, and that can also hit uh, quickly on the vacancy rates. So we can see some great feedback here from you two folks. So um, we are going to get to your live questions soon. So I noticed that some of you are filling in the questions, which are or asking us some questions, so which is great. But feel free to uh, jot those down, and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. But uh, thanks for those questions, Nathaniel. Uh, this one's from Aaron. Is it possible that the creation of this big data analysis system could artificially change the market? As investors shift towards buying or not buying in a certain location based on this information, does that artificially change the location, supply and demand? It's probably exciting for us as an investor. <laughs> yeah. so I sort of suggest that everyone's using location score. Yeah. Um, well, theoretically, it is possible. Statistically, but, it's possible. Yeah, it is possible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, unlikely. I mean, first of all, you've got everyone has a different budget, three hundred and fifty to four hundred, right up to you know eight hundred thousand. Um, then you've got different uh, locations. Some people don't want to invest in a state, so they might skip out on some of those markets. And some people might be after a high yield. Uh, others don't care about the yield. So you've got a lot of variety in just what people mm. are looking for. So you look at the top 20. If that's all we publish, top, top 20 across the country, you're still not going to have everyone just buying in the top market. They, they will have different needs. Mm. And another thing is that in order to sustain this long growth, we have to keep plugging those top markets every month mm -hmm. for what, how many, two years, to get two years of above average growth. So yeah, we're obviously not deliberately influencing the market. If people uh, keep chasing that top market of two years ago, then they'll be continued demand and yeah, the price The will point is down. most people don't have access to this sort of data in a, in a hurry. So yeah. anyone who's using location score has got that. They're, they're in that competitive advantage scenario yeah. Yeah. Um, that Aaron is talking about, but um, we're but, not there yet. And you, you might also argue, um, what's a good illustration of where everyone is flooding into a market and then where does the value go? So take a mining town, for example, where you know there is, uh, you know, you have these situations where rents are going through the roof Everyone floods into the market. The dynamic moves from 70% owner-occupier to 70% investor, 30% owner-occupier. And then as soon as the economic uh, you know, tables turned, everyone abandons the market. So if we're talking about influencing the market or driving a market up, the ultimate value of property will be sustained where an owner-occupier, being potentially the price setter in the market, mm is prepared to hold out to. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So we would get a, a situation as if, if we all said, yes, we're the gurus, everyone everyone going on to one suburb at a time, it'll explode, but then we're, well, there's, well, there's no more growth. So it's just not happening mm. for us anymore and then everyone will get out of it. Mm. So it'll ultimately find its true value over time. And that's why we always love to see areas that have lifestyle appeal, all of those X factors that attract the owner occupier over the long term because we feel that we can get a more sustainable return, especially when you're playing with other people's money. And another point is if investors go crazy buying in a market, then you'll have a very high vacancy rate. Yes. I remember hearing one uh, one spruker saying, I have a dream that every Australian will own a, an investment <laughs> yeah. property. So the vacancy rate's at what, 50% then? Because <laughs> you imagine we'll all just move into each other's houses <laughs> and we'll all have to rent each other's homes. <laughs> Yeah, well, so isn't that 100% yeah. vacancy if every Australian owns a house? Well, well the somewhere. one they live in yeah. and the yeah. one they're rent renting out. Yeah, so. if they own an investment property there, that's, that, there's, it's just market Oh, right, yeah, 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 100%. Yeah. Um, so some great questions coming through. We saw you there, Christopher. Just wanted to say you guys are awesome. Thanks for that. We appreciate that. Um, and the time is skipping away, Ivis. We had better burn through some of these questions. Um, uh, from Yuna. If I'm trying to get into the market for buy and sell strategy, then do I still need to look at all those indicators we have looked at? Thank you so much. Love your podcast, Ben and Bryce. Gents? Uh, for buy and sell, okay, so I assume that's like a flip. Uh, buy, mm. renovate and sell in a short period of time. So there's not much opportunity for capital growth to take place. Location score is targeting markets for capital growth. Mm. Uh, so probably say it's not that relevant, although if you're going to sell it via auction, you want a high auction clearance rate, 
you don't want to be hanging on to it for too long, so you want a low oh, days on market. market. Yeah. So, you want to make sure the vendor discount isn't um, isn't huge. Yeah. And plus, when you buy it, you still want to use those indicators for the buying decision as well. So, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, look, if, if we're seeing a higher score, you're not going to get a bargain in those particular markets. So if you're trying to equity harvest <laughs> in terms of add value and flip that, you probably right. want to go into a marketplace where it's a little bit softer on the demand. Because if you can find an opportunity that can bring the value of that property up to the, the norm of that suburb, the last thing you, you can, you know, you're going to be up against four or five other buyers mm. if you're going to try and buy into one of our high scored suburbs. So, you know, by that stage, you actually might be paying a premium to buy that door upper if you're not going to basically be able to then sell it quickly. So I wouldn't use flipping potentially for the really high areas. I'll be going into areas that are maybe the good as opposed to in the great locations. Adam says flipping only works on TV. Ah, <laughs> very good point. <laughs> That's my big no, point. Some people do it well. Some people do it well. Uh, this question from Anne. I've been using location score since your launch and I think it's fantastic. I was wondering if you plan to further define the criteria in future, such as the ability to report a location score to include the number of bedrooms, bathrooms. Is there a quick one for that? Uh, well, first of all, we, uh, we do plan to extend the criteria of location score, but uh, publishing metrics at the bedroom level can be a bit of a problem. Um, The thing is that to to have a reliable metric, we need a significant sample size. And if we get down into individual bedroom counts, so let's say you're looking at houses in uh, reservoir, then uh, you may have a certain number of houses and you can come up with decent metrics for vacancy rates and days mm. on market. But as soon as you go to, well, there might be some two bedrooms, there might be three bedrooms, four bedrooms, five bedrooms, you're splitting it up. you now got a very small sample size, and so the data becomes less reliable. So getting that granular might not give you the sort of help that you thought it was going to. One thing's for sure, we're definitely going to try this idea of, not for bathrooms, but certainly for bedrooms, um, to try and analyse it, to see whether we can find reliable indicators and, and, and outcomes by doing that. But I suspect, you're right, Jeremy, we're going to have to bring it out into maybe local government area mm. to make sure that the sample size is big enough because our data might be pointing in the wrong direction. So, mm. you know, we'll back test that and have a look at some of the, the, the results that have, that have worked once we can get that. But it's also the attributes in a, in a house are changing people are renovating and a few other things. So first of all, we've got to start with reliable baseline data to actually do that analysis. So um, it's it's in the pipe works um, and we'll continue to make sure, but if we can find a better indicator, we'll do that mm-hmm. first, won't we? Actually, just in the meantime, I'd suggest contact an agent, like a property manager and say, yeah. where's the demand? What are they after? They're after three bedders, four bedders? Or yeah. Do they want an extra parking space? That sort of thing. Yeah, for tenants and also for owner occupiers. I mean, mm-hmm. we've definitely seen a trend closer into Melbourne that the four bedroom houses are, are getting scarcer or in more mm-hmm. and more demand and scarcer and scarcer, but we haven't been able to correlate that into the data set yet. So, you know, we'll just watch this space, but we'll try our best. Thank you, Anne. This one's from Felix. If you pick a location with a high location score, does that mean that the market is hot and you're potentially paying more as more buyers are interested in that market? Yeah, I I get this question a lot, the entering the hot market. Uh, Locations, high location scores are definitely picking hot markets. Well, that's that's what I call hot market. We're at one where demand exceeds supply. And in my mind, there's no such thing as too hot. So obviously the market is going to be hard to buy in. You've got mm. lots of other buyers you're competing with, but the alternative is, is worse. You can go to a cold, cold. market <laughs> where prices are falling. The only way capital growth can occur is if the majority of buyers pay more than fair market value. So you could say, oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna pay above market price, but if everyone says that, there's no capital growth. So it's better to buy in a market when a lot of people are doing exactly that because that's a rising market. The opposite is, yeah, falling market. It also comes down to your negotiation skills too. Thank you, Felix. The next, oh, we've got a second part to that. Once a property has been in a hotspot, how does that affect the future growth? Is the hotspot a temporary boost in appeal? Definitely the location mm. score is a, a short-term indicator of, of potential growth. So it's not looking decades into the future. Uh, whether you get two, five, seven years of growth uh, depends very much so on the market. Anything can happen, you know, APRA could 
introduce uh, new policy changes. Um, it could be the federal civil government war. could say we have too many people in our big cities, and the next little, next lot of two hundred thousand people have to move to the regional areas. Those mm. types of things are you know can't predict earthquakes. No. Yeah, no, but it, but it does it does highlight a point that it's case by case in my view. So you know some of the historical areas that have gentrified have consistently performed well after their gentrification. Um, but some of these more sort of fringe suburbs, which are having a spike in time, do do really well, but then they slow down. So if you've timed that perfectly, you'll be able to release that equity and go again. So, you know, it is, it is one of those case by cases. We would always say that if you're going into a, uh, you know, a non-lifestyle area where people are only there for jobs, you do suffer the risk of, of downside you know, capital value decreases, and that means avoid mining towns like the plague, go into areas where people, we call it the lifestyle test, make sure you go there and I could live here, I could see families living here, I could see communities living here, I could see a lifestyle that I want, and if more and more people see that, that's the demand that's gonna sustain the value of that area. Where I see location score being a value is that it, it sort of eliminates suburbs that you should not even be considering totally. to give you yeah. a, a better chance of being the ones that you consider, yeah. which then gives you another yeah. Um, layer of research to do. This one's from Christopher. I'm a little confused. I subscribed to Location Score after listening to all the Property Couch podcasts and reading the book. However, I am confused. All I've heard via the Property Couch is about more blue chip properties. Yet on Location Score, so many of the top 250 suburbs are far from being blue chip suburbs. Can you please explain why there is such a difference? Yeah, well, I th- we, we had covered a similar that earlier. question. Yeah, we, um, let's, let's recover it because it's important. So, yeah, I guess it. Uh, there is evidence to suggest that closer to the CBD, you're going to get better uh, long-term growth. But um, towards the end of a boom, obviously people are challenged for affordability reasons, so they, they do increase the demand for the fringe suburbs. Mm. So there are periods of accelerated growth for fringe suburbs, and there are periods of accelerated growth for the close to the CBD suburbs. And it depends where you are in your market cycle. Uh, but there's... It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, a fringe suburb is a bad investment, but yeah, as we mentioned, there's, there's possibility for vacant land to be developed and oversupply the area. Uh, so it's, it, it might be a bit riskier, but it could still be a, a good winner for a short period of time. I mean, st- stigma suburbs can still produce great returns. Mm. They really, really can. The confidence you have to go into those markets is what it comes down to, though. And that's, again, you know, we talked, we talked earlier about you know, if we're going to be delivering, you know, sort of a podcast that has a long-term message out in the marketplace, we don't really want to be seeing people ringing us up going, you mentioned this area here, mm. it hasn't done any well, it's got a high crime rate, there's lots of drug use. Yep, I know, but guess what? The property value's gone up 30%, you know, in that time. Well, yeah, but tenants have burnt my car out the front, whatever it may be. So that's why it's, again, case by case in terms of the, the risks you're willing to take uh, in, in that particular area because those areas, I mean, we're, you know, we did some research recently for a potential uh, TV special and that's interesting in itself that we, could, we did find areas where there's property for under $150,000. Come on. That you can buy houses. Surely you know, not. Houses in certain suburbs in certain big m- major towns or even fringes of cities, you can find those opportunities. And with good growth potential. Yeah, yeah. Where, where, the where it's really showing the good growth <laughs> potential. So we want to, so again, it's an, it's an early indicator, location score gets you there. If your risk tolerance and your understanding of what you're about to invest in is beyond you, then don't invest your money there uh, because location score is saying it's got an 80. But keep watching it, see what happens. Um, you know, I've got one in Cairns that I bought for 150,000. I recently did a valuation, on, that was about three years ago. And now that the value has gone about 37% mm. in a short period of time, you can't um, build it for that price. No, you can't. No, you can't. No. Three bedroom townhouse for one hundred fifty thousand dollars in Cairns. So from that point of view, now I'm a more sophisticated investor, and I'm willing to take a little bit more risk for that. But that's the sort of message that we're getting out there that these lower properties they've got nowhere to go but up usually because yeah. you can't build it for that price. So Jonathan's just sent us that I'm not buying yet, but can I get access to Location Score software for a day or so to look at my properties already bought? Yes, there's two options for you. One is you can go to the website and you can put in a free one. Um, to, to test out your suburb, or if you just want to get the week subscription, jet, uh, gents, you can see a number of mm. uh, properties. So we've got a weekly subscription, a monthly subscription, and a quarterly subscription. So if that's you, Jonathan, I'd recommend the weekly subscription might be able to help you with that. 
All right, the next one, please. Uh, excellent webinar team. Just wondering if I should stop using the investment uh, property magazine stats or is this reliable data within maybe a few gaps if you're time poor and can't review each stat on the interest sub suburbs? Keep up the great work. It's um, how relevant is the data in the in the uh, magazines compared to live on location school? You know, I'm not sure about the, the timing of when they release that mm -hmm. data. Um, and de it depends on the source. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure which which uh, data source they're referring to there. Um, I, you know, when I was learning my craft over the 20 odd years that I've been doing it, I relied on a lot of that data in the old magazines mm. um, as a starting point because we just didn't have all that data aggregated. But I think the, the point here is, is again, um, in terms of if I'm time poor, this is about how you quickly um, can consolidate the supply and demand indicators. And then if you want to have reassurance and get confidence, you might go and have a look at the three or five year return and you might have a look at some of that other data. Mm -hmm. Now that's only really about your own confidence because at the end of the day, we want to try and get the most accurate data uh, and our data is uh, only from the month before. Um, as we release it, we normally release it, say, you know, on the 10th day of the month, it should be in the system. So, you know, our, our next lot of data should be out in the next couple of days. So from that point of view, always look at that data. And if you need, again, further confidence to invest the money that you're investing, um, no problems with the magazines. All right, we're going to go for the, uh, we're going to go for the rapid questions now because we're going to burn through a few of these. So sure. let's get, um, let's get. Let's test ourselves on being succinct, all right? <laughs> well, only one of us responded. <laughs> <laughs> so let's test ourselves. So Carla, thanks so much for this webinar. It was great learning too. You touched on the fact that there are some differing stats on opposing websites, and I found this to be true in my research too. Personally, do you take an average of those numbers, or are there certain sites you trust more for this information? 10 words or less. Oh, that's, we you can't do that in 10 words or less. I'll give you 12. Takes your time. This is important. <laughs> <laughs> we look at the metadata around the, the data that we're acquiring and then calculate the statistical reliability from each data source and then we merge them together with an average based on their statistical reliability. That was awesome. That was just as significant as it gets. Yeah, but there's a few other good bits in there, but anyway. <laughs> so, 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 Don't worry about so in summary, it's all summarised. In summary? Uh, we take the average of multiple data sources. We take the average of multiple data sources. Thank you, Carla. Ben, this is one for you, 12 words or less. Don't when you research a suburb that has some of these indicators missing, i.e. no results for vacancy rates in their profiles, do you discount these suburbs or how do you include them in your research? So we don't discount them. So what we would do is take, basically it's a score out of 100. So if we don't have any data, we would give it a 50 as a score and then we would look at that. So should, they should never be discounted because whatever our data source has been unreliable at that month uh, because we could be robbing people of good locations. So if everything else stacks up, because remembering we're taking a weighted average of all of the eight variables to give you an ultimate score. So when we're doing that, um, it's important that if that score is still high, it's a suburb that you should look at. And if there's any data missing, we reduce that statistical reliability Correct. figure. So, so high uh, statistical reliability, if the data's also high, start looking. Beautiful. We've got um, uh, another one from Carla. This location score, take into account future town planning development and other lifestyle factors in the suburbs to give it suitability score. Um, can I take that? No, you start with the location score and then you do that as the extra layer, yes. don't you, afterwards? Yeah, perfect. 12 yeah. words or less, Jess. Yes. <laughs> hey? Yeah, you picked your stuff. <laughs> Next one from Nisha. Is that Nisha? Yep. If a lot of these indicators are good by your estimates, doesn't it mean that it doesn't it mean that it is not necessarily a good time to buy into that market, i.e. if stock market is low, vendor discounting is low, online search interest is high, doesn't it mean the market is quite hot and maybe prudent to wait? We, did, yeah, we sort we of sort covered, of answer covered that, that one. It's, it's better to buy into a hot market than a yeah, cold, one. Than a yeah. cold yeah. one. Yeah, I'd prefer to be sitting on growth as opposed to sitting on something that's basically Falling treading on. water. I'm it. confident you can do 15 words or less on this one, Ben, from Chris. <laughs> Could a downward trending vendor discount metric mean that a selling agent is adjusting the asking price lower over time to reflect the downward trend in recent sales price? I like that. So, Chris, when that property first comes on, we grab what the asking price is and that's what we measure the percentage change to. 
So lo I love the question, but we're all, that's how we measure the overall discount. So they, yes, they keep adjusting it, but we started from the original number that we gathered in the data They set. can't escape us. Can't escape Mate, us. Mate, we got them. We got them. There's a quick one from Nicole, um, and I'll answer this one because it's 12 words or less. You ready? <laughs> Based on your examples, does the location score include all states and territories as you only showed the East Coast or areas down South and South WA? The answer is yes. <laughs> All 15,000 of them for houses and units. Oh, no, you've just blown our word count out. Words to spare. You had 11 of <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. From Ashish, is the research similar to other property commentators' prediction reports? Jeremy? No. No. <laughs> is there a... It's, it's better. It's better. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's differences. What, 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 how would you summarise why we're different? Uh, well, uh, apart from just working... <laughs> um, there's also just uh, a lot more data that goes into it than, than what I've seen from other, other so predictors. This is important because if people are asking to, to buy these reports, it's important to understand what are they assessing. If they're assess assessing confidence from the local mayor or confidence from future plans that might occur in a town, that's not fundamental analysis. Mm. Fundamental analysis is looking at what's actually happening in the market. So if you want to go into a market really early on the on the hope that there's going to be a train line there and one day a Westfield shopping centre, mm. then good luck. That's mm. uh, red or black right there. Yeah. That's not investing, that's speculating. Fred, is there a real difference between fair market price and fair market value? Mm. Right. Good question. And value, yeah. Yeah, what is value? So uh, fair market <laughs> value is what a willing buyer is prepared to to pal a willing seller. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of, um, you know, in terms of what was the other one? Price, price, and price, price versus price value. Versus fair value. market price, fair market value. Well, value's arbitrary. Yeah. It's, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Mm. Um, it's really just what the property sells for. That's that's the fair market value slash price. And that's why when valuers are valuing properties. They're taking the view based on a bank valuation, which is not technically a fair market value. Hmm. The way in which a bank valuer has to value is if we had to, had to sell this property quickly, what would be the result that we would expect to get? And then a lot of people get that wrong in terms of they say, oh, the bank valuation wasn't what I could get in the open market. It's true, because the bank is sort of saying, if I have to distress sell this, um, what am I gonna get? So hmm. you know that's why I always present your properties the best lot you can. All right, gents. Nine minutes. We're going to get through a few oh, more of okay. these. Let's go. Can you see what the weekly sales rate of non? Can you see what the weekly sales rate of non-auction properties are? I reckon that's what it is. Sales rate of non. So basically, properties. private treaty sales as opposed to auction sales in a market on a weekly basis. Yeah. Yes, but I mean we're not we publishing it. No. No. Yeah. No, because a week is too small a sample. We want to get a trend. We want to get that over a month. And um, but yes, of course. As part of the collection of the data that we're collecting, we obviously want to try and get all the data we possibly can on all types of sales going through, as well as sales that aren't going through, i.e. passed in um, or you know still available mm. for sale. All right, let's try and get through some of these on Facebook, gents. Um, and there's a few highs. Um, Adam, Claire, Tristan, Rena, Stario, Matt, Monique, hello, really enjoy your show, thank you. Uh, hey guys, the volume is quite low. Oops, probably should have read that a little bit before. <laughs> should we yell? <laughs> hello! Um, love your show, keep it up. Crossing investment loans is generally a no-no. Would you consider it for cash flow properties in order to save on lenders' mortgage insurance? Particularly when capital growth is not on the cards. No, just release the equity out of the existing property and have as a separate uncrossed loan. I don't know why you would have to uh, cross securitize to avoid LMI. I would agree with that. Um, uh, I'm just reading these on the run, men. So if we can't Go answer them, let us know. You you have negative gearing and foreign investment trying to offshore their monies against potential political change. The 101 fundamentals of economics and markets say so equity markets doesn't apply to property in most cases. People people generally feel safer with tangible assets. I think that might be a statement rather than a question. Yep. So thank you for that, Tom. Oh, but I, I I concur with that. It's a, you know, we talk about it. it's essential need, it's shelter, it's bricks and mortar, it's building our human psyche. It's actually a good thing to invest in. Hey guys, well, this so. is from Aaron. Hi guys, love the show. Would love to know your thoughts on investing in Northwest Melbourne at the moment, Sunbury, Diggers Rest, Gisborne area. Prices appear to be growing quite fast and there's lots of new infrastructure, however, a lot of brand new estates. Uh, I would say that the brand new estates is what you do need to be careful of. You've got lifestyle locations out there. Stay close to the market center, stay close to the transport nodes. 
um, and we are keeping an eye on that. Yeah, location score is is moving well in those areas, mm-hmm. and and this is you know Jeremy mentioned before big hint in terms of the end of the cycle. These are the areas where affordability is, and if people still want to get into their own home, that's where they're going to look because that's what price dictates them getting into that area. So it'll keep pushing them out as they can't afford in. The wave rider effect or the ripple effect will basically take shape. Just on that, I mean, it is typical for the end of a boom, but um, data I've been looking at recently for Melbourne, um, just wondering whether the fastest rate of growth is actually ahead of us. Yeah, I don't yeah. disagree with you. I think Melbourne's still got a bit of, mm. uh, of swing mm. left in its tail. Mm. Oh, I like that. Hi guys, this is from Matt. If you had the option of buying a small one bedroom unit in an area close to the city, or a three bedroom home further away, what would you pick for a first home buyer? <laughs> Where do you want to live? <laughs> That's right. It's a lifestyle choice yeah. there. You yeah. want to be out in the burbs and watch all the street lights go out at 11 o'clock at night and cuddle in. They in used the... Randwick and Gosford as an example here. So Randwick is in the heart of Sydney yeah. oh, versus yeah. Gosford yeah. Up, okay. in the, yeah. up in the central coast. So Yeah, um, yeah uh, central coast is uh, pretty hot. has been a pretty yeah. hot market. Mm, but yeah. geez, if you can afford to buy in Randwick. Yeah. Uh, it's close to a pretty big international city. So mm. It's right in the heart of a beautiful city. Um, as technology increases and people have, this is from Cameron, as uh, increases have the opportunity to work from home, um, do you think there will be a shift to lifestyle locations and therefore values will take over the cities, e.g. the coastal areas within two to three hours of a city? Yeah. I think they'll overtake, but I think they'll be a really strong performance. Fascinating question. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. who knows what the next generation mm. of these uh, virtual devices and uh, software can, can give us. Uh, we don't know. But um, what we do know is if you've got finger on the pulse of the property market, it's not going to surprise you. You'll have things move very slowly in real estate. If you keep your eye on it, uh, it's, it's not going to surprise you. But if you listen to our podcast of about five or ten ago when mm. we had Nigel on the couch here yeah. about some of the things that they can do with that VR stuff, that's going to be interesting mm. how that shakes it, it but up. But it's, it's funny you should mention it because this takes up a lot of my time because obviously you know we're helping people get into property and if we're wrong then obviously there's a lot of debt and not much growth coming into that. So the example that I'm sort of thinking about in terms of human behavior comes into um, the, 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 these uh, games, these online cloud games. We're seeing huge amounts of people turn up to a sports stadium to watch these, co- they're like concerts. They're playing these sports games. Now, what does it tell you about human behavior? So, so if we're sort of saying everyone's then gonna move out to the suburbs, no, people love being attached to people. Like if we could all watch that same computer game at home, but we all go into a room to get atmosphere, yeah. well, isn't that sort of saying the same thing about city atmosphere and city mm-hmm. life? Like even though I could get my virtual my car to come and pick me up and then take me home, I still think there will be people who will be who will, be, who will gravitate to the city, but there will still be others who will say, no, I want the green change or the sea change. Mm-hmm. All right. Gents, we've got four minutes. Let's burn through them. All right. Sean, as buyer's agents for a relatively conservative investor, plus young, is the rule of thumb where you would say, okay, LVR is now X percent, and we are happy for them to go and buy the next one. Keen on capital growth plays at all stage rather than yield. Ben? Yeah, so you know, if I was advising you, risk profile is number one. Um, if your risk profile is high and you're young, and you can recover in case it doesn't go right, then I we, we potentially would look for a, a higher LVR. Nothing more really than around 85, 88% at a stretch. Um, that's the sort of thing that we would do for a higher risk client. If you're conservative, then under 80 all day of the week. Okay, love it. Um... Jesse B. Jesse B. <laughs> Jesse you guys, Jesse. you guys can't see Ibis, but I tell you what, she's got a huge influence over this show. Oh, oh, okay. oh, 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 oh Jesse, there she is. Ash, love Jesse. the show. Thank you. Where, which Opinion one? Opinion just buying oh. an IP and building a granny flat in, in the, the back to increase, increase cash flow. Getting rent from the home in the granny flat. Yep. That's a good question. We've had a few people ask that here in Melbourne. You can't do it as well in Melbourne no. as you can in uh, Sydney. So you've, it's a, uh, it has to in Melbourne. You have to have, you know, it has to be blood. And if the blood doesn't live in it anymore, it has ramifications yep. on the building. But in Sydney, if you can add cash flow why, and you and you can afford it in the budget, absolutely, it's a good way to retire. Yeah, the but debt. just expect to impact on the capital growth. Yeah. Because it's only going to limit a small number of rebuyers. 
Uh, Martin, uh, hi guys, you're awesome. Thanks for your insights. When targeting auctions, how do you ensure that the value the bank will give to the house is close to the price you could pay for it? Good question. Uh, in my experience, I've seen very few valuations not come in at contract price at auction. Um, having said that, I have seen it happen, but I could count on one hand how many times over hundreds and hundreds of auction, uh, hundreds and hundreds of auctions I've been involved in. So the valuer tends to think a uh, willing buyer, willing seller. Um, in a pretty open and transparent marketplace. But it does happen, um, but generally speaking, uh, it comes in at contract price. Yep, but the ones that I always see quickly are the developer, the land's gonna be subdivided or doing something, so there's gonna be a value add to it, and that's where the builder will pay a premium because there's still a margin in the deal for them. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, hi guys, thanks so much for all your great work. I look forward to your podcast every week. I purchased my first investment probably 18 months ago and have had a really bad experience with my tenant. What are your tips for getting past the bad mindset? The mindset. This, well, mate, you, you've got some experience here. Yeah, my first property uh, was great. The tenants moved in, didn't pay a cent in rent, took months to get rid of them. They were so annoyed that I uh, had them evicted. They blocked up all the drains, and left the taps running overnight to, to flood the place. Uh, well, wouldn't you? Yeah, because oh, yeah. they're good people. You're on a good wicket, <laughs> yeah. someone kicks you out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's what you do. Yeah, um, but you got back on the horse. Yeah, yeah. yeah and look um, at you now. Fifteen investment properties later. Yeah. yeah. Um, I reckon there's a couple of things there. First of all, you need a great property manager, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, there's a lot of research that you need to do for that. Mm -hmm. um, you'd probably have some comments on that when you're Bryce. Well, do you remember we had a guest on here, and he said he got a call from the property manager that said, "Oh, look, your uh, your tenant is actually not going to be paying rent for a little while." Um, Six months, but they'll yeah. when they get out of jail, they'll pick up the, <laughs> they'll pick up the tab again. But yeah, no, I agree. You've got to get a good okay. property manager, yeah. and uh, and just think of, think of the big picture. You know, you're you're playing the long mm. game here. Um, it's not a perfect investment class. You've got to be able to. Um, you We've know, got some interview questions for property managers. Yes. Maybe is there a way in which we can? Yeah. Yes, that? if they go to the propertycouch.com.au yeah. uh, in our resources section, um, it's there. Looking at Ivis to make sure. Yeah, but can I just say, don't yeah. don't make a permanent decision for a temporary setback. Yes, yeah, that's right. Stay, mm. stay strong. Stay the game. Bit of gold that? there. All right, folks. Uh, we have got through a lot of questions tonight, and we thank you for uh, popping on. One thing I want to say to you um, is, if you want to work out how this location score thing works, it's really simple. Go to locationscore.com.au, plug in your suburb on the home page. It is free, and you can work out exactly what your location score is for your suburb. Go and do it. Check it out. It's free. It's not going to cost you anything. And um, let us know what you think. And of course, uh, if you missed the webinar. Uh, that we're talking about for this, you've joined us late, just leave a comment here, Ivis will get you a link so that you can check out a replay. So you can see uh, the three of us, we went through the metrics, we unpacked them all, we went through exactly how you could do the research yourself so that you could do this at home. So if you want to get that, just leave us a little note, say, hi Ivis, need the link, put it in the comments and she will get that out to you, won't you Ivis? But uh, any final thoughts, gents? Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> but uh, look, yeah. we, 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 we really enjoyed putting that webinar together. So if that's something that you guys want in the future, let us know in the comments box um, what sort of topics you'd like for the next uh, Facebook Live where we'll get together. We might even get old mate on again. And we're going to be in Sydney. We're going to be in uh, Sydney. That's yeah, right. Well, you can come, come and check us come out. Come and check it out at uh, the Sydney Property Buyer Expo uh, in a couple of weeks' time. If you want a freebie, it's on us, Ben. Yeah, so if they want a free ticket, it's on you and me. It is. They just punch in the code, Ivis, of the property couch. <laughs> no, put a note in the comment <laughs> section. And we'll send Go you to the property couch.com.au. It'll be there somewhere, folks. <laughs> and if you get stuck, say, Ivis, where is it? And we'll make sure we get it to you. But come and say good day. If you turn up to the property expo, um, let us come and say good day. We want to say hello. Let's do some selfies. We'll get them up in social media. It'll be really cool. And uh, give us a like now if you enjoyed this video. Um, or live, <laughs> Facebook. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Now this will be really embarrassing, gents, if there's no, if there's no. Well, let, uh, let me, I'll, oh, I'll watch to see if I get a few. Yeah, let's oh, see. A couple of if anyone's enjoyed it, <laughs> come on. Oh, here they come. Here they come. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll we appreciate that. So, um, thanks, gents. Thanks, uh, I told you I brought the cavalry uh, with me when I sent you out a little email to say I've got the heavy hitters when it comes to property research, I'm sure you got a lot of value out of that. And if we missed your question, sorry about that, we will cover it in another 
um, session. But uh, it's been fun, gents. Thanks, mate. Mm, yeah, Appreciate it. Fun. Thank you for your time for us to yeah, pass on you. some of our knowledge. No life hacks. No <laughs> did you know? <laughs> no mindset minutes. But uh, if you aren't listening to the Property Couch and you've just stumbled across this, we are live every no, we are every Thursday at three o'clock. A new podcast comes out. Check out tomorrow; it's going to be great. The real estate stylist girls, Ben. Wow, it fantastic, is amazing! You've got to check it out. Thanks, folks. Have a good night, and uh, we'll see you next time.